All right, hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Alumni Triton Talk. I'm Amanda Green and today I'm joined by one of my former coaches, Kirsten Cox. Now Coxie graduated in 2011. She coached at Eckerd for two years before founding her own instructor business called Dominate the Dish, formerly known as Cox Softball Training. How are you doing today, Coxie? Good. Just uh, got actually just got home from the facility. It's Monday, so usually that's my busier day. Um, it was only 11 hour day today, so doing pretty good. Amped up, ready to go, and ready to knock these questions out for you. Well, I appreciate you taking the time with me, especially after a long day. So we're just going to jump right into the questions. Um, so like I said, Dominate the Dish, it's located in Tampa. And so I know you kind of coach at various levels, but can you walk me through why you got into, into instruction and how you created your business? So um, I actually, when I was coaching at Eckerd, I was also coaching high school and travel ball. And one of the travel ball coaches, which was a dad, he's like, you're really, really good at teaching. You know, why don't you do instruction? I was like, no, like, that's not my thing. Like, I like the X's and O's. I like hitting fungos and all this other kind of stuff. And it just kind of took off from there. I, you know, did a handful of lessons a week. Um, I used to sell engagement rings. So that was my main nine to five job. Um, I worked for a, a one man company. So I would do lessons on the side, like part time. And then I just kind of noticed I was actually getting really, really good at it. And people were starting to come to me because um, the kids were getting better. And obviously word of mouth is absolutely huge um, in marketing. And um, just started falling more and more in love with it. Um, just kind of saw my trend in the softball world go from, you know, being in the dugout to, you know, being behind the scenes, getting into, um, especially the last couple of years, like the data, the analytics. I mean, you see it in baseball now. Um, it's starting to get pretty hot in softball. Um, so I just kind of took that route. Um, I was actually talking to somebody today. I was like, you know, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a college coach. Like that was like my biggest thing going through high school, going through college. I'm like, Oh, I want to be a college coach. And now that I run my own business, um, I've actually coached at Eckerd. Um, I did a small stint as a grad assistant in West Virginia. Um, I ended up leaving. It just, it wasn't a good fit. And then I ended up coaching a year out in Iowa at the division three level. And I ended up leaving. I was just like, I don't, this isn't where I need to be. Um, so when I moved back, I just told myself, I'm like, listen, I'm just going to be an instructor full time. Um, I'm just going to focus on catching. Um, I feel like that's a big need on the softball side. Um, I know baseball is really taking off with the catching side. Um, I know softball is so just kind of ran with it and just, I got in at a place, an 800 square foot facility um, about three years ago. And, you know, I, I worked around it. I saved up my money. And then um, I, my current place is 2000 square feet. And I'm actually thinking about expanding. Um, I'm in the middle of, you know, trying to get that going, but I just, I've fallen in love with the instruction side of it. Like I said, the data, the analytics, the kids, the people, um, I, I just, I don't, I haven't really worked a day in the last three years. I mean, yeah, I work the long hours, but, you know, it's just, it, it's fun. It's exciting. And I know for people that follow me, like friends and family, um, you know, my social media platforms are starting to blow up. Um, I consult with Power 5 Division One programs now, and it's just like, holy crap, I was this lucky to catch her at Eckerd, you know, uh, yeah, just kind of just being I don't even know what the word is just kind of just hopping around you know almost like a hobo a little bit just trying to find my niche and you know for about the last three years I think I found my niche and you know I've had opportunities to go back into college ball and I'm like why would I leave this right now I mean I've built this from the bottom up a couple times and you know people are coming to me so that's kind of how I got into it is what's funny is I didn't want to be an instructor and here I am at 31 and you know, some people call me one of the better catching instructors in the country, but, you know, I'm kind of humble when it comes to that kind of stuff. I'm like, you know, there's a lot of people better than me, but, you know, it's, it's cool to, you know, be a part of the game, um, you know, dealing at the, dealing with college athletes, dealing with, you know, youth, and again, the parents, the coaches, it just, it's awesome all around. I mean, it's just kind of funny how my life ended up turning out, you know, I, you know, Bo is probably going to listen to this interview too. He could probably count how many times we've had, you know, those heart to heart conversations in his office of Coxie, what are you going to do with your life? And I feel like we have that talk at least once a year 
in my 20s of I don't know like I can't figure this out and now it's yeah I definitely found my niche so that's kind of how I got all started with it and it's it's continuing to grow I mean it's overwhelming some days but it's pretty freaking awesome so yeah when you love what you're doing you're not working at all so yeah um, so you kind of talked about it there you're quite successful you have numerous players alumni um, playing collegiately I think you kind of touched on it there you have analytics and you're catching and your different stuff but what makes your training so different and so successful um I think outside the box thinking uh just being different um you know I get pegged as you know oh you teach baseball where you know I used to think that way too until you know you put me in a room full of guys um I go to conferences where I'm the only female um I've gone to conferences I'm the only softball person active and you know I just I've sat and just listen to these guys that, you know, work in the MLB. I mean, I'm friends with Tanner Swanson, you know, who's the catching coordinator for the Yankees, like the main club, not just minor leagues, just the whole shabam. And just listen to those guys talk. I mean, it just, it clicked about three years ago, listening to those guys. I'm like, you know what? I've never seen that in softball. You know, I was always taught, you know, nose behind the ball, excessive body movement, you know, turn your shoulders back in, this, that, and the other. And I'm just like, that never made sense to me, but nobody ever questioned it. So I started questioning it and I started asking these guys and we just kind of just like fed off each other and we're like, you know what, let's just bring this to softball. And, you know, here locally in Tampa, people started noticing, they're like, okay, you can tell who works with Coxie and you can tell who doesn't. And, you know, I got my big break about a year ago when Georgia Tech brought me on and I just said, listen, I want to do something absolutely crazy. And her and the head coach is absolutely about that. I mean, you know, it's Eileen Morales, you know, big stud infielder, All-American, you know, these kind of things. And she's like, heck, yeah, let's do it. And we switched their whole entire catching philosophy. And, you know, a power five, people are going to pay attention to that. Right. And I had numerous colleges and people start following me all over social media. And they're like, what'd you do to them? And I'm like, this is stuff I've been teaching my kids for years. I'm like, but now you guys see it on a bigger platform. I'm like, this stuff actually works. I mean, here in Tampa, I have a couple kids that their parents are umpires. And if you know anything about the catching style, you know, it's about glove manipulation. And, you know, umpires are like, we can't see that kind of stuff. So, you know, really tackling the receiving portion um, more than the average, I guess, catching instructor makes me a little bit different. Um, I constantly have my phone out not to, you know, be texting people or whatever. You know, I do post a lot on social media, but I always have a camera running on my players. So that way we can go back and we can talk about it. I, you know, the buy-in, the culture, the relationship portion. You know, if you can get your kids to run through a wall for you, they'll, they'll, they'll listen to you, you know. A lot of instructors are drill, 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 and I've kind of gotten away from that, especially having my own facility and having some of the kids come in. They already have a solid foundation. They just want the little minor things that's just going to give them an edge or, again, the outside-the-box thinking because, you know, with COVID and everything else that's happened, you know, recruiting's going to be harder for these high school kids. So I'm telling my kids this is an advantage that you can have by – having this outside the box thinking, having this different philosophy and mentality that, you know, when these coaches go to recruit, you see nine catchers and eight look exactly the same. And then you got the one that stands out. I, I got you to stand out. I mean, that's the whole point of recruiting is standing out. Now it's your job to execute. And the way I operate with my facility is yes, I do individual sessions, but most of my kids are in a group setting three to four days a week for three to four hours a day. Like I see these kids 10 to 12 hours a week and they're competing with each other. They all go to different high schools. They all go to different travel balls, teams, and they compete with each other every single day. And I feel like so, that's something missing in the youth sector of sports is, you know, when I was playing, I got upset. I went to a new travel ball team or I would, you know, a parent wasn't seeing the results with their kid. They go to a different coach. That's not like it with me. You know, I've been labeled as I'm loud mouth, but I call a spade a spade. And the kids and the parents are totally bought into it. And again, that, that competition factor, you know, competing every single day, like 
when my kids do pull downs and they, you know, are doing like some games and stuff, they get up each other's face. It, it's awesome. It almost feels like a little bit of like a football locker room. Like there's no parents at the facility, you know, just because of COVID restrictions. And I've noticed the kids are totally different when the parents aren't in the picture. So I've nipped that out of the bud. So I see these kids in their natural state and I talk to them like how I would talk to you. Like they don't feel like they're being talked down to because they're 15, 16, 17 years old. And, you know, some people agree, some people, you know, disagree, but the, we're getting the results. And like I said, college programs are taking notice and I'm basically giving them the playbook of, listen, you, you know, you're going to do what you want, but if you can take a couple things of what we do here and you put it in your setting where you're at a power five, where you have everything under the freaking sun, you're going to get the results a little bit faster than somebody like me that, you know, operates a facility by myself and I pay for everything out of pocket. So I think that's what makes me a little bit different in the kids that I get a little bit different and I have high expectations, you know, but what they put in is what I put in plus behind the scenes, you know, I'm up late editing videos, talking to college coaches, you know, being active on social media, but you know, I believe, you know, hard work pays off and it's just, it's, it's my mentality. I know you're from the Midwest too. It's just, you put your head down and you do what you got to do. So I think that's what makes me a little bit different than, you know, your average instructor. And like I said, I think more and more people are taking notice. So I guess you could say I'm growing even faster than I think I am right now. So. No, that's awesome. Um, So you touched, you know, you have your academy in Tampa, um, but Mm -hmm. you also have an online program as well, right? Yes. um, I started that like two years ago. Um, I had, I have like 5,000 followers or whatever you want to call it on Facebook and I had a couple parents they were just like you know do you do online lessons and I'm like I don't have time to sit in front of a camera for an hour like I like I like the physical interaction so I was like let me see what I can do so um I I use this platform that a lot of you know fitness coaches use so basically it's just an online program that I send the kids two to three workouts a week you know, it's all aspects of softball, you know, throwing, mobility, uh, receiving, blocking, transfers, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, since COVID hit, um, I've been kind of helping my kids out a little bit more because I have kids from all around the country. So I have kids in the Northeast that couldn't even get to a ball field and there's still snow on the ground. So I've been able to organize Zoom calls um, for the entire group uh, twice a month. And just basically just getting on here and just creating like a Q&A, you know, just talking about anything catching and softball related. And I've had a lot of positive feedback um, with that. You know, there's some kids that are, you know, going to be super active. And then you got some, some of the kids that are just going to sit in the back and just nod their head and just be like, please don't ask me to say anything. But, you know, it's reasonable too. like, I don't charge very much for it. You know, I only charge 50 bucks a month. So that comes out to like less than $15 a week. You know, you're getting two, three workouts because a lot of the kids that join, they don't have catching coaches. They're like, we live two, three hours away from anybody that's legit. You know, this is a good, you know, substitute. Um, And what's cool is most of the kids that are part of that program, they've come to one of my workshops. So they've met me in person. So they know the expectations when they're doing these workouts. They'd be like, okay, would Coxie approve this? You know, um, I'm not really sure of that. And I have an open, you know, communication platform like I always have my phone on me I tell some of the older kids I'm like just text me you know shoot me a message on Facebook shoot me a message on true coach um you know I'll get back to you as soon as I can but you know at this point any extra training that you can get is only a benefit and that's what I really harped on those kids so like I said I have the programming I have the zoom call um a lot of the parents and the kids send me game film um because pretty much at this point everybody's back playing um usually every weekend probably about Sunday night probably about 11 o'clock, my phone starts blowing up and it's game video. So I get to see and kind of critique a little bit. Um, I've also created a Google Drive um, that I drop, like airdrop all their game film in their own specific file. Um, Because I do have college coaches that will message me on Twitter and be like, hey, like I had one last week, um, a division one program said, hey, I'm looking for a 21 catcher. Do you have anybody? And what's nice is I can be like, click, 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 here you go. This is exactly what you need. You have hitting, you have throwing, you have training. 
you have all this stuff right in front of you and you're going to get an honest feedback from me because, you know, you can't be a BSer, you know? So I'm just going to tell you exactly how I feel about this kid. Do I feel like she can compete at this level? Um, you know, I know some of the parents have really appreciated that because I've had some bigger programs ask about some of my kids and I'm like, listen, from an offensive standpoint, I said, I don't think she can handle it. What are you wanting? You know, I'm not going to send a kid to a power five just to say I sent a kid to a power five. I want the kid to go and, and compete. You know, I transferred. I didn't start at Eckerd. You know, I played NAI ball for two years and I ended up transferring because I wasn't playing and a couple other things, you know, and especially in this day and age, like transfer is not the, not the easiest route to go. So, you know, I, I try to offer those services to those that can't get to the facility. Um, and also with COVID, with a lot of stuff being shut down too, um, a lot of them have actually traveled to Tampa. They book flights, they'll go to the, I mean, our beaches are open, you know, so they'll book flights and they'll come down for two or three days and, you know, I'll train them one-on-one -on -one a little bit and, you know, make it worth their while. Um, I've had three kids from the program in the last three weeks come down. They train for seven or eight hours for, you know, a three-day period. And just kind of going over everything in the program, going over of are we on the same page with the philosophy so that way when you're doing your workouts and I'm not there, are you doing something that we're not trying to accomplish? You know what I mean? Like, are you doing this as opposed to this? And it's just, it's also nice to, you know, see a face too. I mean, I've had a couple of people that have never met me and then they come down the facility and it's awesome to be like, we're working out in person as opposed to a computer screen. You know, it's 2020, everything's behind a freaking screen now. So um, that's taken off a little bit. Uh, when schools like colleges and stuff starts, you know, I'm going to pump the brakes a little bit um, just because everybody's getting back in a routine. But it's a nice plan B for those that, you know, can't come to Tampa and or come to my workshops because, you know, I do workshops, but, you know, I always do it in where, you know, it's best suited for me. Like I'll know somebody. I mean, I did a workshop out in the middle of freaking Texas. I mean, it was like two and a half hours from Dallas, and they're like, we're not going to travel there. I'm like, I happen to know somebody in the middle of nowhere in Texas, so that's where I'm going to do my workshop. I'm sorry, but, you know, this is the best, next best option, so. All right, and so working with catchers, what um, technique or what aspect of catching do you kind of really like to hone in on and work with your girls with? Receiving. Um, Receiving because like baseball is big with numbers and we have the numbers, you know, there's at least a 76% chance that you're going to catch the ball. I mean, receiving should be our number one priority. Um, like I said, that's what we do more in games. Um, that's something that, you know, I see a lot of hidden value um, from a pitching staff standpoint, you know, defense, you know, defense wins championships, that whole freaking cliche. Um, but I mean, receiving just because we do it more than anything else. Um, I know some people like to talk about arm strength, you know, the pop time and all this other kind of stuff. But the only reason why I feel like we harp on that is because that's the only met physical metric that we have in softball. Like we have MLB baseball savant, you know, that talks about, you know, hot zones, cold zones and receiving. We don't have any of that. We're actually working on it now. I have a couple buddies in the power fives that I'm like, listen, we need to get some numbers together so we can start creating this. Um, but everybody's been so big on the pop time. But it turns out you're throwing down to second less than 1% of the time over a course of a 50-something game season. So why are we putting so much effort into that when it's come out to say statistically you're not going to throw somebody out? Odds are always against you that the girl is going to be safe. So why are we obsessing about it? If we're obsessing so much about the runner at two, we need to worry about her not getting on first from the get-go. And that's where receiving comes in. You know, how can we steal strikes, create strikes, keep strikes? And that's been my biggest pet peeve, you know, like I said, for the last three years, you know, really digging into the baseball and really digging into this. Um, like you said, we hammer receiving. I have a high-tech hack attack and – my hack attack's looking pretty freaking rough. I bought it in September and the wheels are starting to look really bad. Like I actually looked at it today and I was like, I think I need to fix it because we use real balls. And what's nice is we can dictate spin and tracking and we can throw every freaking pitch in the book. Um, you know, on an average day in group, the average catcher probably catches about 250, 300 reps 
of just receiving. That's not including anything else. Um, so that's why, like, when you look on my social media platforms and you see some of these high school catchers look like freaking college catchers, and they're like, how do you do that? Well, they're catching, you know, a couple hundred reps a week. Um, I have a catcher that's going off to college in the fall. She's playing Division Two next year. You know, during this quarantine, I kid you not, she probably caught close to about 15,000 pitches over three and a half months. I mean, that's been our bread and butter. And when she played a week and a half ago, it looked like she didn't freaking skip a beat. And that's after three and a half months of not doing anything but training. So receiving is the big point. And I think a lot of catching coaches would agree at this point. I mean, we disagree on a lot of things, but I think we can all come to the conclusion that receiving hands down is the most important thing as a catcher, obviously mobility and the physical factors. So jumping back to your time at Eckerd, um, you mentioned earlier and you transferred in. Um, so how did you end up choose to come to Eckerd then? Uh, funny story. Um, so when I decided to transfer, um, my parents kind of gave me this rule of still want you to stay close to home. Um, so I was looking at schools in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan. Um, I was kind of set on going to a school in Ohio up near Cleveland. And I remember being in my dorm room and my mom called me and this was before I had a cell phone. So it was the dorm phone. She's like, why don't you look at schools in Florida? I was like, what? And she's like, why don't you look at schools in Florida? I'm like, mom, like, Florida's not close to Ohio. I don't know what you're thinking. She's like, well, you got family down there. So um, I just remember getting on the computer and Googling all these Florida schools. And I emailed pretty much every freaking school in Florida. I got two answers back. One was from Barry and one was from Ecker. And I told my mom about the two, and I remember her saying, Barry's in Miami. There is no way that a small town girl like you is going to go live in Miami. I was like, okay. And she's like, well, this school is only like 35 minutes from your grandparents. Like, I would be okay with that. Um, so, you know, I had some conversations with Coach. Um, what's crazy is I'll never forget it. He messaged me back, and he was like, um, you know, you're a first baseman catcher. We'll have two seniors in front of you next year. And I'm like, okay, like, I, I don't know if I want to transfer knowing that there's two seniors and I'm a junior. Um, so I actually pumped off the brakes for about a week, week and a half. And then he messaged me back and saying one of the players was leaving. So I was like, all right. So I, you know, begged my parents. I'm like, hey, I want to go visit the school. Um, I flew Allegiant. So I went down, I visited, um, loved the school. You know, told coach, I was like, listen, I'm going to come play in the fall for you. You know, um, I bring experience being a junior. You know, I already have two years of, you know, college ball under my belt. Went home, talked about it with my parents. Um, it wasn't an easy decision, to say the least. And I'm going to leave out most of those details. Um, but then again, I decided to come to Eckerd. Um, you know, I was close with my grandparents. So, you know, I had family down here. Um, just needed a fresh start too. I mean, moving 16 and a half hours away from most of your family um, was a little bit surreal at first, but you know, I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, Ecker, going to Ecker was probably one of the, it was easily one of the best decisions in my life. Like if I didn't go to Ecker, I would not be here right now. Um, you know, just from outside the box thinking, being in the sport, second chance, like all that hoopla. Um, and it, I mean, it basically started from my mom calling me in my dorm saying, well, why don't you look at schools in Florida? And like I said, I literally Googled every school in Florida and I emailed every school in Florida saying, hey, I'm looking to transfer. And, you know, Bo messaged me back and, you know, it, I, I don't regret it. Um, you know, records not cheap. And, <laughs> you know, being 31 now, I'm like, OK, like maybe that wasn't the best decision, but. You know, I look at it as an investment. <clears throat> There's not a day in my life that I regret going to Eckerd. Um, like I said, I think it was the best thing for me, you know, personally, you know, uh, professionally. Um, it just, it's nice to go there and like, you know, you see it all the time. You see our friends doing, you know, what they want in their lives and stuff, you know, multiple years later, you know, it doesn't happen right away, you know, in your middle, in your mid twenties where you're just like, I went to school and I'm not doing what I wanted. And now here I am at 31, you know, I, I live the freaking dream. I mean, that was our freaking motto our junior year at Eckerd, 
you know, we had sweatshirts that literally said live in the dream, and I was like, yeah, I'm living the dream now, so, but yeah, that's kind of how I ended up at Actor. It was, it was a whirlwind experience, but yeah, I'm very happy that I ended up going there. Yeah, I agree. Love that I went to Eckerd. Um, all right, so what is your favorite memory as a time as a Triton? Um, just the bonding with the teammates, you know. Um, I mean, I still talk to my friends, you know, here and there. I mean, we're all older. You know, some of us ran off and got married. You know, some are in our careers and stuff now. But just the tightness, um, you know, with your teammates. Um, you know, we were close with the baseball team. So it was cool just, you know, the creating the, the memories, you know, on the field and off the field, too. Um, I'm not going to get too detailed about that. We're all kind of laughing. Um, I had a couple people master me, and I showed them some of the questions, and they're like, oh, boy. Um, so I'm going to leave some of that out. But, um, you know, just I had a college experience. I wish I would have went to Eggert for four years, but it didn't happen. But, you know, the two and a half years that I was there as a player, student, coach, whatever, I mean, just the memories, man. You know, going to basketball games, you know, hanging out at Kappa Field. You know, we'd have that long freaking practice and we all go to the pub. You know, we're getting, you know, pub wraps from Big Dog, you know, and just sitting and chilling and, you know, the long nights in the library. Um, you know, I joke and I think about, you know, the times where we pull all-nighters in the library. Uh, Amelia and me going to 7-Eleven, getting freaking coffee, and then, you know, locking ourselves up in the computer lab because we wait until the last minute to do stuff. But, you know, just it, it, it was fun, you know. Um, there was some times that, um, you know, playing other teams, you know, when I played, you had Tampa, you had St. Leo, you had Rollins that were just some big perennial powerhouses in the Sunshine State Conference that, you know, we were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, you know, my senior day, you know, we almost beat Tampa, you know, that was a big deal, they were number two in the country, you know, we were one out away, um, just competing against them and knowing that, you know, it could have went either way, and, you know, most people don't know about Eckerd when I played, you know, we weren't really scholarships, you know, we were basically a, you know, almost like a division three program. Nobody was on athletic scholarship. So we're competing against, you know, all these programs that, you know, are scholarship athletes. Um, you know, I remember facing Rollins you know, uh, and then you're just like, holy crap, this is division two, you know, and you're sitting up there up the bat and you're like, Oh, please, please, please let me hit something. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's just the memories with the teammates that really stick out the most for me. You know, they have my back. I have theirs. He said, we all still talk. I mean, we send stupid stuff on Instagram all the time, like some stupid memes of, like, do you remember the Eckerd days? I just, I feel like being an athlete, you get a different college experience than the average college student. And, you know, I'm internally grateful for that. And just Eckerd being really open, you know, I think really, really helped too. You know, athletes all stuck together, which was pretty cool. You know, we all knew each other. Yeah, absolutely. All right, final question. What advice would you give uh, to a current student athlete right now? Uh, enjoy the ups and downs. Um, you only get four years, five years to be a college athlete. You know, nobody wants to get up for 6 a.m. weights. Um, I got a couple kids about ready to leave for college that are in college. And, you know, they're talking about those kind of things. And being 31 now. It's like, dude, I would kill for 6 a.m. weights. I would kill for batting practice right now. Just really appreciate it and think about it every day. Um, I've had several kids come up to me, you know, that have had the opportunity to get back on the field, and they're just like, I think about it every day. That I am so grateful that I get to do this. You know, um, especially with recruiting, it's going to get harder. You know, that whole, you know, 7% that go on to play college, I might drop. You know, so, you know, you're going to have to put in the work. You're going to have to embrace the suck, you know. Uh, the eight-minute mile crap that we had to do when we played, <laughs> you know, I still joke about that with some of my, you know, kids. I'm like, it sucked, but you felt so accomplished when you did it, Right. you know. Like, you just get pushed a little bit different. Um, and academics, um, I know it's really cliche, but, you know, pay attention to school. Get the grades because – I laugh when, you know, going through school, you know, I was kind of the jock. 
I barely studied. I procrastinated like crazy. You know, I did pass and I did very, very well. Um, but now I notice in my everyday life that I use things that I learned in school. You know, we all say, oh, I'm never going to use this in life. You know, I own my own business. I'm a business major. Like some of these things, I'm just like, holy crap, I learned that in college, you know? So keep your head in the books, be grateful, you know, just go have fun and be, have a college experience. And I'm just going to leave you at that because there's some people that are just so here or here, you know, you need to have a little bit of both. You need to be able to have an academic life, a social life and an athletic life. And I feel like at the division two level, you can have all of that. Um, I've actually, I have a lot of kids that I've really preached the division two route because they'll come up to me and they'll be like, you know, I love softball, but I'm not in love with softball. I'm like, okay, well, division one might not be your option is because you play at some of those power fives, man, they're on you all the time. I'm like, you really want to live your life under a microscope. So like, those are things that as, you know, a, a student athlete, you know, those are things that you need to sit and think about, you know, are you very academically driven? Do you want a little bit of everything, you know, are you all about your sport, you know? And there's a, there's a home for you. You know, everybody chases the big schools and stuff, but you know, there's so many colleges out there. There's so many coaches and philosophies that if you want to play college athletics, there is a home for you. There is a school that will fit every single need that you have. Don't just settle on the first one. So I know I kind of got off topic a little bit there, but you know, I just, I, I see kids every day. I see recruitable age kids. You know, I talk to coaches all the time. You know, people ask me about my experience. I'm like, you know, my experience was a little bit unique, but you know, everybody has their own journey. You know, you got to find yours and you know, you got to find your way, but there's going to be growing pains and you just have to put your head down and keep going. I mean, at this point, <laughs> the way 2020 is going, I think we're all kind of at, at that point, you know, we're just putting our head down and just, you know, it's another day. We're going to make it. So but yeah, just have fun. You know, it, it is sports, you know, and at the division two level, there, there's a, and especially in softball, you're not likely to go pro. And even if you go pro and you're only in pro ball for so many years, you get, end up getting into coaching, you get up into different sectors of your life, you know, so enjoy your four years as a student athlete, because you, those are always going to be memories that you have. And you'll always revert back to those as the good times. I mean, I do it all the time. I, like I said, I laugh with some of my kids and I laugh with like Amelia and Kelly and all them, you know, laughing about the good times that we had, you know, on and off the field, you know, and we'll die with those, you know, we're still talking about that in our forties and our fifties when we're married with kids and deep into our careers and stuff. Appreciate you uh, taking the time talking with me today and fans, if you want to keep up with Coxie um, you can, and Dominate the Dish, you can follow her on Facebook at Dominate the Dish or on Twitter at D2D Softball. We'll see you next time.